Now let's talk about the biomechanical principles of stability and balance. A stable object resists movement. Stable objects are typically heavier objects, meaning that they have more mass, have a wider base of support, and have a lower center of gravity or distribution of mass. The two triangles here represent different objects with different characteristics that affect stability. Let's say that the two objects have the same mass. However, the triangle to the left has a very large base of support, and the center of gravity, indicated by the black circle, is low. In contrast, the triangle to the right has a very small base of support, and the center of gravity, again indicated by the black circle, is high. The football player to the right is Michael Orr who played for the Baltimore Ravens. He was considered difficult to move or was very stable because he was heavy, often adopted a wide base of support, and had a very low center of gravity. Therefore, he was good at resisting movement. As we have stated, the definition of stability is to resist motion. So to move, we must actually reduce stability. The infant to the left is very stable because her base of support is very large and her center of gravity is very low. When the infant's parent picks her up and tries to help her walk, she is no longer very stable. She has a tiny base of support and her center of gravity has moved upward. In fact, the baby is so unstable she must be supported in order to move. Balance is an object's ability to maintain equilibrium or to balance the center of gravity over the base of support. If you increase stability, inherently you increase balance. But increased balance does not guarantee stability. The picture on the right illustrates this point. If the person doing a handstand increases her base of support, she will increase her balance. However, although she is able to maintain her center of gravity over her base of support and is thus maintaining equilibrium, she would not be considered stable. It would be very easy to tip her over off balance and disrupt her stability. During motor school acquisition, it is common to sacrifice stability for movement. For example, in this figure, a novice infant, experienced walking infant, and an adult are depicted while walking. Let's compare the three. As you can see, the novice walker has a wide base of support in that the steps are very wide. It's as if the novice infant is waddling back and forth rather than really moving forwards. Second, the novice infant spends little time in single leg stance or balancing on one foot while walking. Third, the novice walker takes very short steps such that there's very little time in which he or she only has one foot on the floor. In contrast, with increasing skill, the experienced infant and adult begin to have narrower walking patterns, spend more time in single leg stance, and take longer steps. Again, in order to move, one must reduce stability. For this last section of material, let's explore how we can apply the principles of motion and stability to observe and analyze movements. In 1997, Carr outlined the steps necessary to observe and analyze motor performance. The first step involves observing the skill. Although this might seem obvious, the question is really how to observe the skill. To do this, we must do the following. A. Determine the optimal viewing angle. Is the movement and all the components of the movement visible from the front or back, from the side or overhead? For example, the best viewing angle is from the side for a standing long jump, as depicted here. B. Determine the best environment to observe the movement. For example, if you are interested in observing someone running, you must have sufficient space to observe that movement. Alternatively, if you are interested in observing someone performing a standing long jump, one must make sure that the surface is such that repeated attempts may not cause injury to the person and thus cause different movement patterns to emerge. C. You must view the movement multiple times, and each time one should focus on different aspects of the movement. In this way, it might be best to record the movement and rewatch the video to assess different aspects of the movement upon second, third, or fourth viewings. The second step involves analyzing each phase of the movement and decomposing the movement into its key elements. For example, what are the phases of the movement? 
How does a person perform during each phase? It is also important to examine the phases of movement or body segments. What is the timing of these phases of movement or the timing of different body segments in the kinetic chain? In the figure at the bottom, the phases of a windmill, pitch, and softball is decomposed into six parts, and one can compare an individual's movements with respect to these different phases. The third step involves considering the mechanical principles of motion stability. For example, is the person stable? Does he or she properly take advantage of the kinetic chain? Is the timing of the muscle forces or body segment motion optimal? Are the movements efficient? The fourth step involves selecting which errors should be corrected or which errors should be corrected first. The key is to focus on the major errors first, then one can work on each aspect at a time before addressing subsequent errors. The fifth step involves determining the best approach for correcting errors and teaching new skills that build upon the fundamental movement pattern. To do this, one must consider the following. Maintaining the safety of the participant. For example, if I want a child to practice their overhand throw, how many throws would be appropriate and would not result in injury? You should also use words that are appropriate for the individual when communicating the instructions. You should provide sufficient opportunities to practice and give sufficient time for instruction. Lastly, you should use outside resources like coaching guides, textbooks, and websites to help supplement the information you provide or employ a different format that might be more suitable for a particular skill. The important thing here with this last point is that you should be able to select reputable sources. Okay, let's recap what was learned in this chapter. In order to understand how we learn to move and develop different motor skills, we must first understand the physical and biomechanical principles that govern how our bodies move. This includes principles of motion, including Newton's three laws. This also includes principles of stability and balance. By analyzing movement from this perspective, we can gain an insight to why individuals move in different ways and how to improve movement or promote different skills.